Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We are so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. Uh, before we read, I'd just like to do a quick recap of what we've been doing this month as a church. The theme for us this month has been holiness. And we began our series with the holiness of God. And then we moved on to a passage from Peter, First Peter, which talks about, in fact, God commands us to be holy because he is holy. Because ultimately, the basis for our holiness comes from the character of God. We are not trying to be holy because we somehow got this brilliant idea and uh, we want to pursue this path. All Christian holiness draws or comes out or flows out of the character of God. The God that you and I worship is a holy God and that's why there is a need for holiness for you and me. The God that you and I Worship is holy, and that is the reason why he demands holiness in each one of our lives. Then we moved on the third week from a passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul says, it is the will of God that you should be sanctified. And uh, Pastor Kay last week talked specifically Um, on holiness and sexuality. But the basis for that is, again, what God has willed for us. It is God's will that we have to be holy, and that's why we pursue holiness in our lives. If we look at another aspect or the basis for our holiness from this passage, may I ask you to please look into your Bibles or the screen, verse 1 onwards, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now... You must put off, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And about about all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ will dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do 
in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Shall we look to God in prayer and ask his help once again? God, even as our, this, this written word is before us, open before us, we know also that unless the Holy Spirit illuminates us, O oh God, we will not understand anything this morning. And so we are at your mercy, God. We pray that you will move in our midst, that you will open our eyes to see the truth of your word, and that we will come, O oh God, and be desiring, O oh God, to, Lord, apply this truth in our lives. God, as we come this morning to you, we know that nothing is hidden from you, O oh God. Our lives are like an open book before you. Lord, we are naked before you, O oh God. And so we pray that you will speak to us, that you will minister to each one of us, O oh God. Lord, that we will not hide under our masks, O oh God, that we will come, Lord, before you just as we are, and we will respond to your word and honor your word by aptly responding to your word. So we pray that you will do that in our midst, do that in my life, do that in each one of us, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I've titled my message this morning as a new identity and a new life. A new identity and a new life. Before we get into our passage, I'd like to, you know, always do a little bit of a background of that passage and the book. Now, the letter to the Colossians was written to the church of Colossae, at, at Colossae which was founded by a person's name, Epaphras. He was probably one of those who got saved under the ministry of Apostle Paul at Ephesus and later became a fellow servant of the gospel and planted this church. Now, Colossae was one of the important cities of the ancient world. It was especially important because it was one of the connecting points of the Eastern and the Western worlds. So a church at a place like this could have played a significant role in the spread of the gospel uh, to the Western world in the first century. And yet it also made it vulnerable to all kinds of pagan philosophies and mysticisms and along with the Jewish legalism, and so on and so forth. Now, while Paul begins with this letter with thanksgiving for the church at Colossae, he specifically writes this letter uh, to correct the false teachings that were swiftly spreading in Colossae. Now, we do not know the exact nature of these false teachings because they are not you know, explicitly mentioned, but it can be, you know, certainly inferred from the statements that Paul makes to oppose such teachings. And so you can categorize those uh, uh, heretical teachings that were doing the rounds. And I'll just like to briefly mention what those are. There was this ceremonial, Jewish ceremonialism that was there where it you had to hold on to strict rules and you know certain kinds of you know foods and avoiding certain things and you know adhering to religious festivals and so on and so forth there was also asceticism you know which called for severe disciplines that even including inflicting your body there's also a kind of spiritualism you know, that was prevalent, which encouraged worship of angels. There's also this um, Gnosticism. It was not fully blown Gnosticism because uh, it was not until the second and the third century that Gnosticism actually became like, you know, the full-blown version of it. But there were roots of Gnosticism 
also in the first uh, century. And what they claimed, these false teachers claimed mysterious, superior, enlightened knowledge that set itself above the gospel. And what these teachings did was that they utterly devalued and undermined the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so to refute these heresies, Paul first declares the supremacy of Christ in creation. Not just in creation, but also in salvation. Not, al not only in salvation, but over the church. He not only defends the supremacy, he also, uh, he, he not only declares the supremacy, he also defends the supremacy in light of these heretic, heretical teachings. But then, he goes on to do something else, my friends. He declares the supremacy of Christ. He defends the sufficiency of Christ. Then he moves on and he says, you know, this supremacy and sufficiency must be demonstrated in your life. He calls for a life that will display and demonstrate the supremacy and the sufficiency of Christ in daily living. Like most epistles of Paul, this letter is also divided into two parts. The first part is doctrinal. The, the, the second two chapters, you know, the th three and four are practical. The first two are about what we are to believe. The, the second two are about what we, how we are to behave. The first two are about our position in Christ. Uh, the second two are about our practice in Christ. And so on and so forth. So in most epistles of Paul, this is the division that you see, and this, is, this letter is no different. It all begins with doctrine, but it doesn't end there, my friends. Doctrine must lead to duty. In other words, in Christian living. Orthodoxy must lead to orthopraxy. In other words, right belief must lead to right behavior. Otherwise, what, it doesn't really matter what you believe if that does not translate into behavior. One of my favorite preachers, Stephen Lawson, says something like this, and I paraphrase it. He says, right belief without right living makes a stagnant Christian. Right living without right belief makes you a shallow Christian. Right belief that leads to right living will make a strong Christian which is God's desire for each one of us, my friend. So as we come to our passage this morning, which is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 17, you can see that there is a clear division in this passage. This passage can be divided into three parts based on the three broad commands that are given in this passage. But... For all the three commands, there is a basis. Paul first lays the foundation, the basis, or the motivation, and then he says, this is why you have to do this. And we're going to look at the basis first, and then look at the three commands that are there in this passage. If you look at verse 1 through 4, this is, what, this is how it reads. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, your life is hidden with, in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now the word, if, the first word there is better translated as sins. In other words, since you have been raised with Christ. That's the basis of Paul's argument or the call for, you know, holiness. Is since you have been raised with Christ. And what does that mean? 
Everybody listen to me carefully. Christ dying for you is substitution. But the New Testament never stops there. But the New Testament also says you died with Christ. That is identification. In other words, union with Christ. Christ died your death. That is true. But you also died with Christ. You also were buried with Christ. You were raised to with Christ. You are seated with Christ. You will appear with Christ. Now that is the motivation here for Paul for living a holy life is that there is this new identity, my friend. There is this reality that that Paul, you know, opens his readers to. He says, listen, it is the holy living is not based on regulations. Holy living is not based on self-determination. Holy living is not based on these severe you know, severe things that you do to your own body. Listen, you know where it all hangs? In your union with Christ. And that's why, just read one verse before chapter 3. It says, these have indeed, because these false teachers were teaching these kind of things, these human man-made ways of dealing with these kind of things. And Paul says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And then he says, since you have been raised with Christ. My friends, you and I can not even... Desire a holy life without the work of God prior to that in our lives. Without the work of grace in our lives, we cannot even think or desire a life of holiness. It has to begin with God. Unless we are raised to a newness of life, unless we are raised with Christ, Christ, like I said, Christ not only died for us, but we died with Christ. And this entire first four verses, Paul is establishing that. He's giving reason after reason, but the whole point of every single reason is that you are united with Christ. This is your identity. You, and if you look at the larger context of the New Testament, you see this over and over and over again. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. But the life that I now live, I live in the flesh by by faith, the Son of God who called me, loved me and called me. That's the basis. It goes on to say in Colossians chapter 2 verse 20, we are dead with Christ. Romans chapter 6 verse 4, we were buried with Christ. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, we are made alive with Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, we are raised with Christ. Ephesians, uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 17 we are, will be glorified with Christ. Now that becomes the motivation or the basis for holiness in this passage. Our new identity. I have been crucified with Christ. I'm dead with Christ. I'm raised to a newness, I'm raised with Christ to a newness of life. This is my identity. Now, Paul says, now go live out that. You keep becoming 
what you are in Christ. That is the whole thesis of this chapter. And let that be seen in every single area of your life, your, your personal life, your church life, your family life, your work life, and your witness life. If you continue to read this passage, let that become, become all that you are in Christ. But being raised with Christ also shows us something else. It talks about the resurrection power. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. That is this, you know, when, when you, you look at this verse, or this phrase, raised with Christ, it is not an ordinary kind of thing, my friend. There is God's power at work. When Christ was raised, when you were raised with Christ, it, it was by the power of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 to 20, it says, What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated at his right hand in the heavenly places. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If we have been raised with Christ, it not only talks about our identification with Christ, it also talks about the power of his resurrection that is in, it, is in us through his spirit. In other words, uh, it is impossible to live a holy life without the Holy Spirit. So a holy life is characterized or is basically life in the spirit. And Paul basically nails this in his letter in Romans chapter 6 and 8, he, in 6 he says, you are dead with Christ and all that identification. Chapter 8, he says, you know how to live a holy life? It's a life in the spirit. And that's what I just want to work through in this passage. The first command in this, or the first imperative or the command that we see here in this passage is, Pursue the heavenly. Pursue the heavenly. Because it says, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above. Now think about it, my friend. Before you and I were saved, we never had a desire for the things that are above, things of God. I don't know about you, but I'm saying this in all honesty. I thought preachers were clowns. And I thought, you know, singing Christian songs were meaningless. And I used to sleep through almost every message that I heard. Because it was so boring. Because I, I didn't have anything to do with this. It didn't make any sense to me. Absolutely. But since you have been raised with Christ, this is what Paul is saying, since you have been raised with Christ, your identity has changed. And not just that, your software inside has changed. Before you never sought the things of God or the things that are above. Before you never set your mind on things that are above. But because of this reality, this new identity, new work that is done in you, and this new deposit of the Holy Spirit that is in you, you are able 
to seek the things that are above. To seek the things that are above, to seek is to set your heart, set your desires, set your affections on the things that are above. And maybe this morning, if you have no desire whatsoever for the things of God, for God, maybe the chances are you're not even saved. You can do all kinds of things, my friend. We can do absolutely all that we want to do. But if you probably do not have for a prolonged period of time, you've never had any desire for things that are above, Paul is saying, you are probably not raised with Christ. Because since you are raised with Christ, in other words, if you are raised with Christ, then this is how you live. Are you with me? Thanks for nodding, some of you. I get encouraged. You know what? What does this seeking the things that are above mean? Because even the false teachers of the day talked about things that are above. In fact, they were only above. <laughs> they were not here. You know what they taught? They offered secret knowledge. Nobody knows. Only I know. Secret kind of knowledge. And they claimed to be revealing some kind of mysteries and special wisdom, some kind of new experience, a new philosophy, and they branded it as heavenly. But Paul counters that and he says, listen, that is earthly. That is of the flesh. In fact, you know what he says? He calls them the elemental spirit, demonic. However, in the context of this book, to seek the things that are above or to seek the things of God. To seek the things of God is ultimately to seek Christ. To set your minds on Christ. Why? Because he is the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Why? Because in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. 120. Because he is the mystery of God. You don't have to sit around and think about the mysteries like, you know, these false teachers. He is the mystery of God. And they were talking about wisdom and knowledge that was from the other world. And Paul was saying, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and the knowledge of God. So see Christ. To seek things that are about are to seek Christ. To set your minds on things that are about are to set your minds on Christ. To seek, you know, it also means to seek victory over your sin, which he, you know, progresses. It also means to seek the character of Christ, which he talks in the third part. It also means to seek living a life that is worthy of the Lord. One of the commentators says, he kind of summarizes this, and says, since you have shared in Christ's resurrection, your aims, your ambitions, in fact, your whole outlook are to be centered in him. The Christ becomes center. If you're saying, I'm seeking the things that are about Christ is center, Christ is your life. Paul reminds them. My friends, you and I can never live a holy life if you don't start desiring one. Seek things that are above. It's not something that somebody else does for you. We work in partnership with God, especially after we are saved. Before that, it's only one way. God has to regenerate us. But after we are saved, because we have the Spirit of God in us, 
That's why these commands make sense to us. Because of your position, because of what Christ has done for you, now you start seeking. Now you start setting your mind. Before that it was impossible. Now you start setting your mind. Do you have a desire for holiness? Are you seeking it, my friend? Because there's no point coming and listening for all four weeks and live the same for the rest of this year. If you don't have our God and say, God, give me a desire, oh God, for holiness, to seek the things that are above. In fact, the word um, set your mind means keep on minding. It means to keep your mind, to, to dwell on, to keep your thoughts fixed on, to consider, to think and rethink, to ponder, to keep thinking about, to fix one's attention, to fill your thoughts with. Paul is saying, set your minds on this. You know, in other words, let your mindset change. Because that is one of the beginning points of a pursuit, a life in pursuit of holiness. Our mindset needs to change, my friend. When we start beginning to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates, you just live in, you know, without all this and you say, okay, somehow I want to live a holy life. It is not going to work. Set your mind. Let your, let your thinking change. Let your, your convictions change. If you think that, you know, you, certain things are not sinful, you will continue to do that. Like you, when you see in this passage, he not only talks about, you know, sexual sins, he talks about sins of the speech, like anger, like lying. When you think of a holy unholiness, we're thinking only about these things. But Paul says, listen, these things are also incompatible. They're not compatible with your new identity. So, number one is to pursue the heavenly. Number two is to put off the earthly, put off the earthly. And you know, again, the basis for this is put to death, therefore. In other words, all that Paul has established before becomes the basis of this putting, putting off or to put to death. Put to death. Why? Because you have been raised with Christ. You are dead to your Old life with Christ. And that's why you are supposed to live this kind of a life. Paul says in um, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 onwards, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? If you've died to sin, then live it out in your life. Don't be friends with sin. Hate sin. In fact, the word that is used here, put to death, mortify, kill sin. Keep killing sin in your life. We'll talk about how to do that later on, but very quickly, I know you're all worried. I'm still in my second point. So let me... Quickly move on. That's my old habit. I need to put off and put on. <laughs> we have, we see sexual sins here that they need to be put off. We need to put off or put to death. I'd like to briefly read for you those things sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Now, sexual immorality refers to any kind of sexual intercourse outside of marriage. It can be before marriage. It can be after marriage. Something that is out of the boundaries of marriage is immorality. And Paul says, put to death. If there is those elements in you. And then he talks about impurity. Impurity refers to what we would call as, you know, perverted forms of sex. Even homosexuality and things like that. And then he moves on and he says, passion, or some translations use the word lust. It, it refers to erotic passions which are aroused by visual things. And I don't want to talk much about it. I'm sure Pastor K spoke about it last week. How our entertainment is a kind of a hook that arouses the, these sexual sins in our life. So pornography falls in this and all kinds of, you know, uh, anything that arouses sexual passion falls in this category. And then it goes to evil desire. And is again closely uh, associated with lust. It is this mental uncleanness which can go beyond sex. Where Jesus... You know, it's, it's very similar to what Jesus says. If a man looks at a woman and lusts after her, he has already committed adultery. You don't have to perform the act. It's a mental act. And then he goes on to say covetousness. The, the desire for more and more and more. And ultimately, he equates that to idolatry. If you look at the sequence of these sins, it's sexual acts, and he actually goes further and points out at the sexual desire, and then he goes to the root of it, that is sexual sin has become the god of your life, your idol. And the modern term for idol is addiction. We can't let go of it. And that has become your God. And Paul says, the wrath of God is coming because of these things. Because God never tolerates sin. But for those who are saved, we are saved from the wrath of God. But may I also remind us that the same holy God who's displeased with sin in our lives, will choose to lovingly discipline us when we continue to pursue in these ways. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people and therefore put to death Mortify, kill. Now listen, the false teachers taught, like I just mentioned, it is through some kind of ceremonialism or asceticism, even, you know, so severe that they even probably advocated mutilation of your body parts. But Paul is trying to say, listen, mortification is not external, it's internal. Put to death. And how does that happen? I would encourage you to read this book called The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. In that, one of the chapters, he specifically talks about mortification of sin. And this is what he says. To mortify a sin means to subdue it, to deprive it of its power, to break the habit pattern we have developed of continually giving into the temptation to that particular Sin. The goal of mortification is to weaken the habits of sin so that we have the right choices. In other words, to, to weaken your 
area of sin that you're constantly fighting. To starve it to death. Do not make provision for the flesh. That is what Paul says in Romans chapter 13 verse 14. Put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In other words, don't keep entertaining it. Some people say, you know, I, I actually don't do it. I just talk about it. Listen, you will fall. Some people say, you know, I don't actually indulge in this, but, you know, I just watch. But you will eventually, don't make any provision for your flesh. Don't strengthen it, weaken it, and kill it, my friend. That's the point of this. And how do we do that? We don't have the strength. How and why do we do it? Because the Spirit of God who lives in us. Because Paul also says, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's again both these things. Your identity of who you are in Christ, your union with Christ, but also the power that the Holy Spirit supplies. I may not finish all my three points, so I'll just focus on this and then I will try to wrap up. There are also sins of speech. The minute, like I said, the minute we think about unholiness, it's only thinking about sexual sin. So if somebody is involved in some kind of sexual thing, then we are like, we feel as if they are worse than us. But what about lying? But what about, you know, anger? What about malice, my friend? What about this wrath, this uncontrollable anger in your life? What about this? What about, you know, slandering people? That's unholiness. Someone talking about lying said, it is an ever-present help in time of trouble. God has to be that, right? But I lie because it's an ever-present help in time of trouble. So it's an easy way out. But you know what? The Bible, Paul says, how can you do this? Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with your pride. Again, he goes back to the identity. You are not this. So why don't you get rid of this old practices with your old life and put on the new self, which is being renewed. I had a few things to share about lying, but I don't have time. But then the motivation, again, is the identity in Christ. And also here, he talks about being renewed. That's the reason that he gives here. And put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of God. Why shouldn't you pursue this life of anger and hatred and malice and, you know, character assassination and your sins of speech, you know, and lying and all that. You know why? Because this is something to do with your old life. Now you are in this new life and this new life is being renewed. You are becoming like Christ. This is your journey, my friends. So why get rid of all those things that don't make you look like Christ? I was, I was convicted of this so much. I had to go and ask for forgiveness. Because there are times you can get angry. And in your anger, you can sin. But it becomes a habit. Something is terribly wrong. You need to act on it before it kills you. But also, he talks about not just sexual sins, not just sins of speech. He also talks about social sins. Where do I get that from? Verse 11. Here, there is 
not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, is that how you pronounce? Uh, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. Yes, sexual sins. Yes, sins of the speech. It's not just what you do and desire in your heart, but what you do with your tongue, you know, is an instrument of holiness. But then also your relationships, your, how you view people. If you have this thing, you take pride in your ethnicity, you take pride in, you know, these kind of things. My friend, this is unholiness, according to scripture. This is pride of life. In 1 John, it is mentioned as pride of life. This divisions that, you know, if you are trying to cause based on, you know, who you are and trying to form some groups and all this kind of thing, this is unholiness. Why? Because Christ is in all. There cannot be any barriers. We must be one beautiful family of God. That's unholiness. And one of the things that I was thinking here is, in our fight for fight, in our pursuit for holiness, one of the things I think practically we can do, which probably helps is to write down our specific sins, just like the list is here. There are times we're saying, oh, I'm not living a holy life, but then we kind of generalize our sin and say, God, I am sinning, please forgive me. Rather than doing that, I think we need to name our sins before God and say, these are the areas that I'm struggling with. The sexual areas, oh God. The speech areas, oh God. These areas with relationships, oh God. Be specific about your sin if you want to fight sin and live a holy life. Of course, everything based on what Christ has done for us already. Now, number three, Pastor K said this, so I'm going to three. I'm going to finish off quickly. Put on Christly. Pursue the heavenly. Put to death the earthly. Put on the Christly. It is not enough to put off, we are to put on, we are to replace it, that which is Christly. Paul also gives a motivation here, or the basis here. The basis ultimately, you know, our, our identification with Christ, but he also gives a few other things here. He says, as God's chosen, holy, beloved it's basically saying, as God's chosen, you did not choose God in this, this unmerited favor, this grace of God. And the love that he has lavished on you. And he calls you holy because of this. Now put on the Christly. Here, all that we read here is basically the character of Christ. In other words, if you are raised with Christ, live like Christ. Does that make sense? If you are raised with Christ, live like Christ. It's not something that we put up. Because if we put, put up, my friends, it, it is fake. It won't last long. You try loving people, you know, just on your own. You, you can try that twice, thrice, four times, five times, after that, because you're all bottling it up, you will blow up. It's not something that we try to do. When it says put on, it's like desire it, want it, actively, you know, actively submit to God, but as we abide, He is the one who produces the Christ-like character in us. And what does He use? He uses the Word of God, and that's why it says, Rest, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. You want to live a holy life? First, fix your eyes on what happened to you. I have been crucified with Christ. I am dead with Christ. I am raised to a newness of life with Christ. 
but also think about the resource that God has given us. This life of holiness is life in the Spirit, my friend. You cannot live a holy life without the help of the Holy Spirit. So depend on the Holy Spirit. And then be, you know, desire it. Fix your eyes on it. Let your mindset change. And also remember that you're being renewed. You are in the process. So if you stumble, listen, God is not finished with you yet. You are in a process of becoming like Christ. And finally, how do you put on Christ? Is when you dwell or let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. The Spirit of God transforms and bears the Christ-likeness in your life and my life. But the last thing, the verse 17 says, you know, do everything in the name of Christ. That is the ultimate motivation for holiness. You know, you and I don't are not holy just because somehow we want to shine the brightest before everyone and we can look down on everybody else. No, 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 no. You know what the motivation is? The name of Christ may be glorified. I want to pursue holiness so that Christ's name might be glorified in my life and through my life. Shall we close our eyes, look to God in prayer?